Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who walked in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when, divided, when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born to, for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice, and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this.
truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chain shall he break for the slave is our brother. I'm reading from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly possessions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all inequity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. This is the word of the Lord. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was descended from those of the house and the family of David. He, was with, he went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and he was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around about them and they were terrified. But the angel said unto them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy that will be for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the child wrapped in bands of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to the God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known unto us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about the child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. Normally, around the 1st of December, or even mid-November, the whole world 
goes into a parallel universe and everything changes. Even the driest, hottest places suddenly start singing about snow. Parents who are extremely careful with their children are suddenly perfectly fine with letting them sit on the lap of a strange old man and tell him what they want for Christmas. And those of us who hate cooking transform ourselves into gourmet chefs and turn out large numbers of cookies and candies to give to everyone we know. Even those of us who hate to spend money will spend hundreds of dollars on presents to give away, all in December. Everything turns fuzzy around the edges in December, like a Norman Rockwell painting. Every day that leads up to Christmas is soaked in tradition and holiday spirit and nostalgia and sentimentality. It's, as we hear again and again on the radio, wherever we go, the most wonderful time of the year. Even the scripture texts that we hear today conspire to lull us into familiarity and comfort and a pleasantly numb uh, sense of familiarity. If you don't know any other text of scripture, you probably know this one because you've heard it every year in church and and Charlie Brown's Christmas and I don't know where else. But it's part of the experience. In that region, there were shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Of course, the highly ritualized nature of the season and the high expectations that we put on this most wonderful time of the year often serve to amplify whatever else is going on in our lives. So when we're grieving or dealing with loss or discontent, the contrast between the perfect firelit Christmas we're presented with in our songs and stories and rose-tinted memories can painfully contrast with the reality of our own lives where people are missing or money is tight or the whole family comes down with the flu the day before or the preacher messes up the Christmas sermon. The difference between what we remember and imagine and what we're experiencing can grate painfully on your sense of what ought to be. And if that's true, even at the best of times, it's intensified this year when we're grieving lost jobs, lost experiences, lost lives, well over a million and a half, almost two million. No aspect of our lives this year has remained untouched by the virus, but that's even more evident here in the holiday season. Maybe the golden light of Christmas starts to feel a little bit like guilt or tinsel. Pretty enough, but not much help when the rent is due or you need to pay your bills. Not much use when the problems of the world are very much large and persistent and staring us in the face. But of course, if we knock the cobwebs of familiarity out of our ears and really listen, the Christmas story isn't that sentimental either. I know very little that trips my nostalgia switch less than taxes, and I can do them on my computer. I imagine that those of you who keep sheep or goats or cows or livestock don't find late-night care for those animals particularly, you know, sentimental. And while I've never traveled long distance on foot or in a saddle while heavily pregnant, I can't imagine that that's pleasant for anyone involved. And you know, even the angel, 
Even when I was a toddler, no one had to tell me not to be afraid of the bronze angel, paper mache angel that lived on top of our Christmas tree, or those statuettes of pretty ladies with feathery wings and white-edged dresses that line the shelves at Cracker Barrel. Nobody had to tell me to be afraid of them. Or those babies, plump, naked babies with little bitty wings that you see in greeting cards. Has anybody ever been afraid of those? But the angel Gabriel, he must not have looked like any of those things, because the first words out of his mouth to Mary are, don't be afraid. In fact, the more you look at these oh-so-familiar texts, the less soft and sentimental and Norman Rockwell-y they get the more they're filled with the sharp-edged, uncomfortable realities of life. They belong less and less to children and nutcrackers and firelight and cookies and more and more to the world that we live in for the other 11 months of the year where worry and real problems and plague are commonplace. And that's just the Luke text. The promises of Isaiah, as glorious as they are, are extremely frank in assuming that you don't live your life in a golden haze of religious light. In fact, they are specifically addressed to people who live not in the light of the Christmas tree and the fireplace, but to people who perceive themselves to be living in deep darkness. People who know the feeling of the yoke of oppression across their shoulder blades, who know what it's like to hear the boots of tramping warriors, who are all too familiar with the sight of clothing that's been stained with blood. It's the people who live in a land of deep darkness for whom the light has shined. So you know, maybe it's okay if your Christmas this year is more like the first Christmas than you might wish. More dominated by financial concerns. Too well acquainted with fear or anxiety. Held too far away from friends and family. Joseph and Mary know what that's like. Maybe it's okay if this year the storybook quality of it all is missing. Because if we take Isaiah seriously, and I recommend it, this means we're in exactly the right place this year to see more clearly than ever, in a new and fresh way, the work that God is doing in us and in the world at Christmas. Maybe that other world, that Norman Rockwell painting world of snow and firelight and perfectly happy, peaceful families climbing the church steps hand in hand. Maybe that world doesn't need God's saving. Maybe that world doesn't need God's intervention in quite so drastic a way. Maybe that world doesn't need the terrible wonder of God being born as a helpless baby to unwed parents who are worried about taxes and the government and their future. Maybe that world doesn't need God to live a life constrained in the same way our lives are constrained. But our world does. We do. We need him to save us. We need him to break the yoke across our shoulders and burn the things that have been used to hurt us. We need his authority to grow and eclipse all other sources of authority. We need him to save us. I heard a sermon recently, a good sermon, that rightly pointed out that when Christians talk about salvation, we tend to be talking vaguely about the next life. We're talking about the future salvation of our souls after death. And that's well and good. 
this preacher says. But what about the rest of us? What about our minds? What about our bodies? What about our lives? Those need saving too. And so at the first Christmas, the God who is spirit from eternity took on flesh and dwelt among us. Despite all the things that are unworthy of his glory, despite the pain and the evil that we suffer and inflict on other people, because he loves us, because he doesn't want to be without us. The baby in the manger, that's where Christmas begins, but it's not where Christmas ends. If it were, it would be a sad and ironic kind of story, the story of God leaving eternal blessedness to come here and dwell with us for no other reason, I suppose, than that misery loves company. But the child wrapped in swaddling bands and laying in a manger was a sign for the shepherd. A sign, not a thing itself. It was the engagement ring, not the marriage. He's here not just to suffer with us, but precisely to claim, to lay claim to our flesh, our bodies, our lives, our dwelling places, here and now, here in 2020, here in Dublin, Virginia, or wherever you are. He's here to save everything that makes us, us. Not just the bits that we put on display when we go to church. Not just the bits that are clean and tidy and acceptable. Everything. His authority, said the scripture, will grow continually. It's going to unseat and overthrow everything else that has power over us. Everything that threatens our peace. Everything that threatens our flourishing. So his authority is good news for us because it's grounded in love. It seeks our good. Love came down at Christmas, says the hymn, the song. And that's true. Love did come down at Christmas. But he didn't come down to be snuggly and cute and sentimental. He came to bring light and hope to a world that sorely and desperately and hopelessly needed it. He came to claim the whole world, all of it, all of you, to heal all of you, to restore all of you. So I hope today and tomorrow you'll celebrate Christmas. I know it's hard this year. I know a lot of us have scaled way back in what we're doing, how we're decorating. But even if all you can do is light a candle on your table or text a friend or write a letter, I hope you celebrate Christmas. It's exactly for this kind of year that Christmas happened. It's for times exactly like these that God gives us the promise. The grace of God has appeared, and his name is Jesus. In our darkness, a light has shined, for a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen.